we've gotten into science now that is so complicated that the average person can't even comprehend it. Uh, I had some handouts for this, and I just looked at them, and I said, forget it. There won't be one, probably two people in that room that can take that and make sense out of what's on these, in this format. So they have to be able to distill that down so that the average person can make use of this. Well, let's go through the goals. We've got group one looking at the causes of CCD, and they're going to compare the virulence of Nosema apis and Nosema serrana. Uh, and we know Nosema serrana is one of the problems that we have out here now. Um, it's got, in its overhaul, overall, uh, or the way bees react to it, compares favorably with what we're looking at, with what pe most people report in colony collapse disorder. Um, we want to look and compare the pathology of both Nosema apis and serrana to find out what makes them different, what makes them similar, so we can come up with new treatments. Right now, we got one thing out there, Pete McGillan, to treat with. Uh, we want to understand genes responsible for immunity and their response. Remember I said this research wasn't just pouring something on it and seeing what happened? We know Every organism out here got a specific response to a certain treatment. We want to know genetically why those bees react the way they do to a pest and to a treatment. Because we think sometimes our treatments may very well be our problems in some cases. Moving forward, they want to uh, characterize the effects of um, uh, Nosema serrani in colonies, determine the competitive replacement of Nosema apis by Nosema serrani. And that's a very important thing. How fast is Serrani replacing Apis as a major pest in our colonies? If we don't know that, then we can't even set up stopgap measures. We want to determine interactions between nutritional status and Nosema diseases. And uh, a lot of the researchers have discovered there is a distinct correlation between bad nutrition with honeybees, and diseases. Now, nutrition in itself is one of the most important things. I can tell you, I work with a lot of dairy farms, a lot of beef cattle people. You can take the most down to earth average cattle producer. They can tell you exactly what a cow has to have in her diet at a certain point in pregnancy or a certain point in the lactation curve to make that cow produce. Can we do that with honeybees? We can't. Can we? we don't know it. We also know because we've changed our environment, and another thing is that bees not even native to this continent, that we don't have everything out here in most cities, varieties of pollen, different nectar sources that are available to these bees. So we have to look at nutritional problems in detail. Um, <coughs> Look at and learn survivorship of newly emerged adults to single pathogens. That is, how the young bees react to just one problem in the colony. They want to look at newly emerged adults to multiple <coughs> pathogens. We know with CCD, basically works like a house of cards. One thing builds on another as we go through it. Um, one of the things they're doing. Uh, um, up in Delaware is looking at treating bees. We, you can see here the bees are being inoculated by various things in these containers. They incubate them, pull bees out, look at how these organisms are, are going through their bodily systems. They take these bees and reincorporate a lot of them back into colonies and follow how introducing these pathogens is it's working in relation to them. Um, we want to understand the survivorship of newly emerged adults to single and multiple passive pathogens and abiotic stressors. What are abiotic stressors? That's exactly what we pour on these bees to treat them for our various problems. When we put a chemical in a colony, it creates a problem. It creates a stress for those bees. So how do these bees react to that stress plus having the stress of a pathogen or another problem in that colony with them. So they're looking at a lot of things in depth, interactions between pathogens and stressors in colonies. Very in-depth studies that are gonna tell us a lot about these bees 
why things happen and how things work with it. Um, we want to determine the role of pests and pathogens and pest and not pesticides in stationary colonies. And I'm going to talk about this one a little bit later in the program. Why do we want to look at that versus something else? Well, we basically have beekeepers that move their bees. We have beekeepers that are migratory beekeepers that move them all over the place. Strong correlation that heavily migrated bees are causing a lot of creating problems for themselves, should I say. Um, again, these are the institutions that are doing the prime work on our first goal. Um, looking again to develop diagnostic tools for high throughput. That means we can run a lot of data through this thing at one time. Increased molecular information on pathogens. Um, a lot of neat work being done on that. You may even see things in the future that if anybody's ever watched an old Star Trek episode where the Dr. McCoy had his tricorder and he could walk up and we may very well have something in the future and not too far down the road that you can walk up to a colony and it can sniff out a disease simply because of the molecular <laughs> formation or a certain product that a, a pathogen gives away that a little protection unit can pick up. Wouldn't that be neat to be able to walk through an apiary with them? Um, we want to look at sub-lethal effects of pesticides. It's one of the things Dr. Delaplane has been concentrating on for a number of years. Uh, we also want to demonstrate the economic efficacy of IPM of integrated pest management for working in our colonies. All those things tie together very well. Um, this is a pretty neat little study. <coughs> we know that chemicals that have been used in beekeeping have been showing up in our wax. And this is a study that was done at UGA. Uh, they took uh, wax samples from Monroe, Georgia, some that uh, Dr. David uh, Dijon in Brazil sent up, and some from the UGA bee lab, and these were from chemical-free operations. And we see that we found contaminants on all levels. The uh, Amitraz, the reason they didn't get a detection on that is they had some body faulty protocol for looking for it in wax. So they're going to redo it for Amitraz. Um, but it's kind of curious that you see this stuff show up. I know the fellow in Monroe, Georgia, that was Bill Owens that they got wax from. Bill had been through about 20 generations building on their own cone and reusing that white cabbage. And it still showed up in there for some reason. Is it in the equipment? Is it in the old wax that's being recycled in the colony? We don't know. It's one of the things they want to look at. This is pretty curious. When you're two or three years down the road of not using chemicals in your beekeeping, and yet we're still finding high concentrations of these chemicals in the wax. I'm going to skip through this because, ah, here we go. One of the things they're looking at is exposing bees to various pesticide products or various pathogens there. They can actually tether a bee down, put her there, blow the stuff in her face and expose her to a, a heavy dose of this material. And they mark her and then go to the field and release the bees. I want you all to, under, if those of you who know Keith, you can see he had a real hard job here. He got to take the jar of the uh, Tupperware box out, drive out, and call Jennifer and says, I just turned them all loose. Here they come. <laughs> and there's poor Jennifer. <laughs> she's sitting in the colony, and she's waiting for all these Mark B's to come back in and see if they could find their way home. That, that's pretty basic research like David and I have done over the years. But it's interesting in that you expose these bees to certain chemicals, and these are chemicals we use in our mic control, by the way, and a lot of them don't come home. And they haven't released the numbers on this yet, but it's, I've seen some of the preliminary stuff. It's pretty interesting to see how these chemicals in just a quick one-time exposure are affecting those bees' ability to guide themselves back home. And, uh, Pretty nice, neat stuff there. Goal two, 
identify genes that confer resistance to varroa and pathogens. Now you think we've been doing this for years, but we're getting better at this. And what we want to do is continue to develop those things. Screen populations and commercial queens for genetic diversity. Remember me saying something about that bottleneck effect we're getting? We want to get a broader genetic base. One of the problems we have is USDA, and I hate the USDA guy left because I was wanting to hit him this upside the head, won't let us bring any new stuff in the US. 